Hi guys, welcome to History with Robin. Uh, thanks for joining me. We're gonna be talking about the Telegraph uh, today, uh, which we talked a little bit about yesterday, um, but we're just gonna talk a little bit more about it today and this um, new invention in communication technology and the things that came from it. Hi guys, I'm glad you could join me. Uh, I am, my costume today is one of the women that live in the dusty west. That's why I have my handy handkerchief to keep the dust and sweat off my neck. Um, you, Lorna, you didn't miss anything. We just got started. Okay, so the beginning of my slideshow is a little bit of um, a recap or going over the um, communication, different modes of communication at that time. So if you've been attending my other webinars, um, you will, some, a lot of this will be familiar to you. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Um, great. Okay. So what we're going to be talking about today is the telegraph. Um, I see some of you, um, are raising your hand. Please make sure you type it into the Q and a box. And Joseph, hi, you weren't here yesterday. Is there a recording you could watch for yesterday's webinar? Yes, there are recordings. Um, they're on our YouTube channel. So if you go to the Delphian Schools YouTube channel, there should be a tab or some sort of playlist that is the webinars. And so you can actually watch any of the history webinars I've done or any of the webinars anybody else has done um, on our YouTube. Sorry, just trying to read your guys's questions. Lorna, the beginning part of this will be familiar, um, but there will be some more information about it. So, so here we go with the part that's familiar for some of you and maybe new um, for others. Um, so in 1860, America had close to half a million people living in the West. That was California, Oregon, Nevada, Utah, um, but communicating with that part of the country was slow and difficult. Um, you could take the mail by steamship, but that might take around three months for just one way. So imagine being in San Francisco and writing to someone in New York and you don't hear back from them for six months. That would be kind of crazy. Um, if sending mail by, slow, um, by sea was slow, what about by land? So by 1860, they were putting mail on trains and that was pretty fast, but it was only good in the east part of the country where they had laid a lot of tracks, which on my map here are those red lines. Um, the problem was that they had almost no tracks that went past the Mississippi at that time and the furthest west stopped in St. Joseph, Missouri. From St. Joseph, Missouri, you could take the mail the rest of the way across the country by stagecoach. And that took maybe one to two, um, oh, it took one month one way. So it took one month for it to get one way. And so to get a letter there and back would be a total of two months. Then came the Pony Express, which is what we talked about yesterday. And, and those daring riders and their magnificent strong horses that cut the time down to 10 days one way and only two weeks round trip. So that was a lot better than any of the other options. But what if there was something that could go much faster than ships, trains, and horses? What if there was something that could go 186,000 miles per second? fast enough to zip around the world seven times in one second. That would be pretty incredible. Well, there was, it was electricity. But the question was, could anybody invent a way to be able to send messages using electricity? Evelyn, great question, what's round trip? So round trip um, is when you start in one place and you go to where you're trying to go and then you come back. That's called a round trip. 
So like if you went to the store and came back home from home and came back home, that would be a round trip. Yes, yes, Lorna, great answer to the question, a complete trip. So there was someone who was thinking about how he could use electricity to send messages really quickly. And his name was Samuel Morse. And in, oh, did I skip a page? Sorry guys, I think I skipped a page. Hold on. Oh, nope, I did not. Okay. So in 1825, he was 34 years old and he was an artist living in New Haven, Connecticut. He'd gone to Washington DC to paint a portrait of a famous Frenchman. While he was there, he received a letter that his wife had gotten ill, that she had taken ill, become ill. And he rushed home to help, but he found that she had already died by the time, she got, by the time he got there, which was really sad. And the letter was just too slow. So at that moment, he decided he wanted to create a faster way to get messages across a distance. Evelyn, that's true. Morse code was named after him. And we're going to learn a little bit about Morse code um, in, this, in this webinar. So in 1832, Morse, while traveling, met a man named Charles Jackson, who was a scientist. And Jackson explained to Morse that there were recent discoveries about electricity and how messages could be sent over distances using copper wire. Um, there was a German inventor named Samuel von Sommering who had invented such a device but it used it needed 35 wires and it could only send a message about one mile um, it was called a telegraph tele the part of the word tele means distance and graph means writing so that means a way to write over a distance and this right here you can see is a picture of i think that first one um, the first one of the first telegraph that was invented. So, so Morris knew that a telegraph that needed 35 wires would be very expensive to build. So he decided to try to make a telegraph that only needed one wire because it would be easier to build and it obviously would be cheaper. So by 1837, he had succeeded. Little electrical signals were sent from a battery at one station down a wire to another station. These signals would make ink marks on a strip of paper, but it was hard to read and didn't work very well. Now yesterday, some of you guys asked questions which I didn't answer about how the telegraph worked and how the messages didn't get confused. And what it was, was think of the telegraph sort of like sending a text message. Um, when you send a text message to your friend or your mom or somebody else, it goes straight from your phone to the other person's phone. So telegraph, um, the telegraph, it would go straight from one um, station and travel along a wire to the next station. So there weren't um, lots of lines that it could go on, but there was just one line. So if you wanted to send it from St. Joseph, Missouri, you'd go to the telegraph station in St. Joseph, Missouri, and they would send it on to the next station, which would send it on to the next station, which would send it on to the next station. And, the, and there was one person who was in charge of sending them. So the messages didn't get mixed up. Lila, it's okay that you're late. We're talking about the telegraph. So, so you can see over here, this is the telegraph um, uh, that, it would, that they would send messages with. Um, how fast was it? I think it was very fast, because remember how fast earlier um, they, you know, it, electricity can travel really, really fast. So once they figured out how to harness that electricity to do it, um, it would be really fast. So, and Jolly, what did they use? 
Um, to send the messages, they used like these wires and the electricity would pass along the wires in a certain pattern and they learned how to, um, they created a code, Morse code, which I'm gonna talk about in just a minute, where they could um, have the, the dots and the dashes would mean something. So, so by the next year, Morris and his helper had invented a special code from the sound that the electrical signal made. They would use a telegraph key to make the sounds. So you guys can see over here um, on this picture, you can see like there's a couple of wires and there's like a little knob that the person is pressing down on. That's the telegraph key. Um, when you tapped down on the key, electricity from one wire would pass through to the other wire and make a sound. The longer you held down the key, the longer the sound. And they made a code using just two sounds, a long sound and a short sound, and they called it Morse code. Okay, so if you guys are not, um, if you guys are not familiar, Morse code, in Morse code, each short sound is called a dot and each long sound is called a dash. So you can see um, the sort of the picture that's at the bottom, the chart that's at the bottom has a code for letters and numbers. So to make a letter A, you make a dot dash. So that would be like a short sound and a long sound. To make the letter B, you would make a long sound, a short sound, a short sound, and a short sound. And in Morse code, you can make all the letters and the numbers. Evelyn, yes, all of it was on one, all the messages went on one telegraph line. Um, so that you, so they wouldn't get mixed up. There was like one way to send a message there. Did people have to memorize the Morris code? Lorna, I think people probably did. And I'm, and I think probably for sure the, um, the men and women who worked at the telegraph stations had to know it well enough to be able to decode it. Um, so are you guys ready to hear the sounds of Morris code? So I'm gonna play this little video. You guys should be able to hear it. I can't hear it on my end, but we're just gonna watch a little bit of it and listen to it. So remember, in Morse code, to make a dot, the short sound, you just press the telegraph key for a brief moment. To make a dash, the longer sound, you press the key for a bit longer. That's all there is to it. So once you learn the code, you can recognize what the sender is saying. Okay, so here we go. Okay, so I hope you guys could all hear that. Did you guys all hear some of the different sounds that the dots and the dashes could make? <laughs> it sounded like music. Yes, I think that's probably true. Sorry, you guys have some great questions. What is a sender? Violet, the sender was the person who was sending the message. So the person who had a message at one point that wanted to communicate it to the other point. Okay, good. It was loud, Milo. Okay, well, I, good. It hurts your ear, Joseph. Okay, I will try to keep that in mind when I do my next one. It was very loud. Okay, just imagine if that was what you heard all day. Okay, so now I have another video I'm gonna, I'm gonna play for you guys. Um, we're gonna watch about a minute and a half of it. You're gonna get to see a girl demonstrating how to use the telegraph key to make Morse code. 
So anyone who's learned more Morse code would be able to understand the message she sent. Do any of you guys know Morse code? I definitely don't. But if any of you guys do, it might be fun to see if you can figure it out. Okay, and if it's maybe was too loud last time, maybe you wanna adjust your volume just a little bit. I don't actually know how loud this video is gonna be. Okay, here we go. We're gonna watch one minute and 30 seconds of it. Hi, Internet. So today I'm gonna to be showing you guys about Morse code keys. I know this is a little different from what I usually do, but let's get to it. Okay, so now here we have three keys. One of them is a Stanford key made in Switzerland. We have a Bulgarian army key and a, Be and a Begali key. So the Stanford key it's a, uh, has metal at the bottom, then wood on top, and it's coated with a white or blue. This is just a prototype, so they have no logo or anything. So I'm just gonna do a quick demonstration. Like always, you have to make sure that your hand is um, aligned with the key. And also you're holding with three fingers. So if you're left-handed like me, then you're going to put your thumb on the right side, your middle finger on the other side, and your index on top. Like that. If you're right-handed, then I'm just turn there. If you're right-handed, then you're doing the opposite. So the thumb on the left side, the mi middle on the other side, and the index on the top. So like that. So now I'm going to do a quick demonstration with my left, left hand. Okay, good. Well, I hope you guys were able to hear that. I don't know what she actually said, um, Anjali, uh, but that was kind of cool, right? So you could notice the difference about when she did like a long sound um, and a short sound. So, so going back to the, the history of the telegraph system, um, by 1838, Morse had, work, had a working telegraph system that used one wire and a code to send messages. That code that we just heard, and the one wire went from one station to the next. However, the batteries they had could only send the electricity about two miles. With this limit, um, he was going to need a telegraph station every two miles with the telegraph operator inside. The operator would listen to the signal coming with its message, write it down, and then, then enter it and pass it on to the next station two miles further. And then the next operator two miles further and further and further. So as you can see, that probably that is better than other things, but still not great. Oh, it says Morse code. Oh, you guys are so great. Thank you for looking that up. So, so this was a big problem, this two mile, like having to do this every two miles. To get a message all the way across the country, you'd need 1,500 relay stations and 1,500 operators. But also, have you guys ever played the game telephone? In a circle with your friends, you whisper a short message to the first person, then the next person, you know, the first person whispers it to the second person, then the second person to the third person, and so on around to the beginning. And what's the message like at the beginning, at the end? Is it the same or different? And then just imagine doing that with 1,500 people. So there was a lot of chance that with going message going from one place and another and another and another and another that it would take a lot like the message could get messed up and the original communication would maybe be lost so morse developed something called a relay it would take a message coming into it so it would it, you'd come the wire would come in it would take the message coming into it and it would relay or pass on the exact same message going out but boosted by a fresh battery, which was near the relay. So he would put these every two miles on the line. And this took away the need 
for a telegraph office um, operator to listen to the message, write it down, then enter it in it newly. The message would come in and go out on exactly the same, would come in and go out exactly the same each time, all automatically. And then in the drawing, you can see the incoming and outgoing wires. So you can see it came in here, it passed through this little thing here, like where B is, and it went out on D. So that, that helped and it made it so that it was done automatically. So now Morse had a system that worked over long distances. The problem was that he didn't have enough money to build, to build that system. Wire and equipment was really expensive. So finally, by 1844, he had raised enough money to build a telegraph system, the 38 miles between Washington DC and the city of Baltimore. On May 24th, he famously sent his first long distance message, what hath God wrought? And this means, what has God done or made? And that was the first long distance, um, first long distance message that ever traveled. Morris offered to sell his telegraph system to the US Postal Service for $100,000, which today is about $3.5 million. And they said, no, they didn't wanna buy it. So Morris sold his telegraph technology to private, um, private companies and the race to connect cities all over America was on. So all these different private companies, they strung up wires on what became known as telegraph poles to go the long distances between cities. Joseph, I'm sorry, I don't know exactly how long it would take for that message, but I have a feeling it would go pretty fast. <laughs> Alette, I agree. I would have said this was awesome too and just taken him up on his offer. So by the, the mid-1850s, there were over 23,000 miles of telegraph lines laid, mostly in the more populated areas of the eastern United States. You can see the main lines on this map. Um, so you, that's what those red lines were. But they still hadn't even gotten co close to the west coast. So, so it's possible that certain companies own certain telegraph lines that went between different cities. Like maybe you own the one between Washington DC and Baltimore. Sorry guys, I think I, I messed up on my thing again. Okay, but no private company by itself had enough money to go all the way across the country. So the US government hired several companies to all do parts of it. And they got started around 1860, around the time that the Pony Express began their service. They had to string 2,000 miles of wire on 27,500 poles. They had to cross plains, mountains, rivers, and deserts. So all so what you can see, and I actually think this picture, that's so funny, this picture that's behind me is also this picture that's here on my presentation. And you can see, hopefully you can see, there's like a guy at the top of the pole. And what they would do was they'd have to put those poles in the ground and then they'd have to string the wire from them. And Jolly, what is a relay? A relay is a little um, thing that Samuel Morse invented where it was like a little machine where the message could come into the little machine and be sent out exactly the same. So someone didn't have to write down what they thought it was and then enter it again. It was just a way for it to automatically pass um, to the next line about every two miles. Now, Holly, a great question. Would I rather Pony Express or Telegraph? 
Um, probably the telegraph because the communication passed faster. So, um, so that is, uh, so it'd be a faster way to communicate. Oh, Alette, it isn't the same picture. Okay, well, it's an awfully same, it's an awfully similar picture. Um, how do they cross the mountains, Brando? Great question. I think what they would do was they would just find the best place to put the poles up and then cross over the mountains. So this was the route that they chose. You can see the line on, on the map is the route that they chose. Notice how similar it is to the route that the Pony Express riders were using. So it was very, very similar. And um, I think that is really because it was the best and easiest route to get through. AG, what if the pole broke? Well, then they'd have a problem and they'd have to send somebody out to fix it. Um, so that they, you know, because I think they would find out that they, couldn't get the message through and they'd go out and look at it. I, I also think that people would inspect what was happening and look at what was happening on the telegraph lines because they didn't want them to fall out. Um, why did they need the poles for the wi wires? Another great question. Because they hadn't figured out that they can put wires under the ground. Um, so the only way they had you know, and if they put them on the ground instead of under the ground, then they might be broken or animals might eat them or something might happen to them. So they put them up on poles. So that wasn't a problem. Lorna, what a great question. Would I rather have a job in the Pony Express or putting up telegraph poles? I don't know the answer to that question. Probably putting up telegraph poles because I could, I feel like it might be slightly safer though. Who knows? Okay. So here's another example of a guy putting up a telegraph pole. So on October 24th, 1861, they planted their last pole on the border of Nevada and Utah. Now for the first time ever, a message could go from New York City all the way to San Francisco in just a few minutes. And to think that only 20 years before, when President William Harrison had died and they wanted to get the news to the West Coast, it had taken 110 days. So that was a huge, huge advancement. Getting faster messages across the continent of North America was accomplished, but what about across the ocean to Europe? In 1866, Morse made waterproof equipment <coughs> and helped pay for running waterproof cables on the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean all the way over to connect to Britain. Isn't that unbelievable? To me, that is unbelievable. <laughs> Joseph, 110 days is more time than President Harrison was even president. Well, that, that is a funny fact. So others continued laying telegraph cable all over the world. By 1891, most of the world was connected. So you guys can actually see, this is a really cool map. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The red lines are the telegraph lines that connected all over the world. So Samuel Morris died a rich man in 1872 at the age of 81. During his lifetime, the advancement in the speed of communications had gone from about 30 miles an hour to millions of times faster. What important messages, when important messages needed to get through quickly, <coughs> sorry guys, like the one he got in 1825 about his wife being sick, it was now possible. And it was in no small part because of the vision and the hard work of this artist turned inventor. <laughs> That's, thank you, Lorna, for that message. 
in Morse code. Some of you guys asked if I could go back to the page um, where the Morse code was listed. And since I have a couple of minutes, I was gonna go back to that um, in case any of you um, guys wanted to um, copy it down. So I'm just gonna go back through my slides. Oh, there we go. So if any of you guys wanna copy that down, you're welcome to. Um, and one of the things I wanted to say, which wasn't in my presentation, which is many things were invented or came from the telegraph. Um, they, you know, somebody asked about them using the telegraph poles for telephone poles and telephones were the next great invention and that increased the speed of communication after the telegraph. And Alexander Graham Bell, who actually invented the telephone, is the father of the telephone, was a telegraph um, operator and spent many, many years sending, um, you know, messages through the telegraph system. So that sort of inspired him that there maybe would be a better way um, to communicate even more clearly. Um, Um, which would allow you to be even faster in your communication. Some other things which grew out of that, maybe not directly, but kind of the same idea, um, was the fax machine. Now, for some of you guys, you maybe have never seen a fax machine, and it might be ancient technology for you, um, but it's a way that you could send pictures through the phone line long distance. Um, there was another thing which was called a teletypewriter, um, <clears throat> which was kind of like a fax machine, sort of, but you had like a typewriter on one end and you could type in a much longer message and it would be sent over those lines to another typewriter on the other end where it would print out the message. Um, so those were just some advancements that actually came from um, the telegraph. And if you study history a lot, or if you um, read about history or other inventions, you can see how later inventors or later explorers or people who found new things sort of were um, standing on the accomplishments of the people um, before them. So that's one of the things I really like about learning about the telegraph. Um, because I think it, it makes it easy to see how this one invention or this one um, advancement made all of these other ones possible. Lorna, question, what is R? Oh, you're right. I can't see what R is. Um, I'm not sure how to full screen it. I'm so sorry. And Evelyn, what was your question? I'm sorry. Oh, did they use the telegraph poles? for telephone polls later. Yes, I think they did. <laughs> Mackenzie and Denali, I'm sorry. I'm not sure how to full screen it, um, but I hope you guys could easily probably research that. Oh, my technical, my technical person. Oh, there it is. Can you guys see the full screen now? I hope you can. This is James, by the way. I just showed up and it He just like, showed up and it hates. fixed. So it's a dot, <laughs> a dash, and another dot. So hopefully that answers your guys' question about that. Um, good. I'm so glad you guys enjoyed learning about the <laughs> telegraph. Uh, we are going to be, I hope you guys can join me next week. Um, when I'm going to be doing my last two, we're going to be talking about the Transcontinental um, Railroad, um, which goes along with these ideas we've been talking about, about increasing communication and speed. Um, and then we're going to be talking about cowboys and cattle drives. So thank you guys so much for coming to my webinar. I hope... Um, I hope you guys learned a lot and, um, and I hope to see you guys next week when we talk about these other things. Okay.